up to the front and wishing her a very happy birthday. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's going to be online only. 
So we'll probably get a postcard or a letter saying go online and look at it. Um, you know, maybe for the regular election in November they'll have the back paper. But there's so many candidates and so much on the ballot. I think they just decided it's too expensive to print up millions of copies. So. Uh, the Fidelma Democrats are an independent democratic association with a focus on education. Uh, we like to remind everybody we are not a PAC. <coughs> we cannot endorse candidates or contribute to their campaigns. We do invite democratic candidates to talk about issues and legislation. And if you want to contribute to candidates, we encourage you to go to their websites. There's a lot of wonderful candidates running uh, for various offices this year. Um, so do that. And uh, you can find out what the Skagit Democrats really support as well. Uh, Isabella is recording our, she's back there with a friend, and they're recording our uh, meeting, and it will be on um, the YouTube channel that we have. So if you know somebody who would like to hear what's going on, please uh, tell them to uh, get on the YouTube and they get a uh, You'll get the link sent to you if you're on our mailing list. I do want to let you know we're not going to be meeting in August. Uh, we decided to take the month off because so many people are gone and busy in the summer. Uh, we will be meeting in September, on September 10th. And we've invited all the legislators from the 10th and the 40th to come. And uh, it'll be more of a meet and greet. They'll talk about their candidacy. but. Um, we'd like people to actually get a chance to talk to the candidates, get to know them a little bit. And so that was what we did. Um, we, you know, the, we have uh, in the 40th, it's Deborah uh, Lakanoff and Alex Rammel in the 10th. Uh, we have Dave Paul and Clyde Shavers there for the State House. Um, Janet St. Clair is running for Senate. Um, she's a wonderful candidate, so she's running against an incumbent. And uh, we're trying to support her. And Richard Brocksmith is running for the Seattle County Commissioner. And so he's a real interesting and uh, dynamic man as well. So, and again, they all have websites, and they're very glad to take your money. So. <laughs> and Liz Lovett. Huh? And Liz Lovett. Yeah, oh, Liz, that's right. I, for somehow, I'm going to get on my list. I'm really sorry, because she's running for Senate as well. And so, uh, uh, before we get going, I'm just going to ask, are there any uh, party officials, Democratic officials, PCOs? I know Rita's a PCO. I think that's about it tonight. But OK. Um, there is a Skagit Democrats uh, newsletter if anybody wants that. Uh, get online and get it. It's great. Don Ambrose does a wonderful job. There's also a Whitby Island News uh, letter. So uh, if you're interested in what's going on down there. And a couple of other things. There's always the set Sunday afternoon rally, 12 to 1 on the corner of Commercial and 12. And we'll probably start getting more and more people there. Uh, you can be sure the Trump people will be there forever. So we're hoping. But when we lose a draw, they'll be there. Um, and we will, uh, I'm sure, we'll start getting there. And we do get some good coverage from Caleb Sprouse, who's a reporter. So what I'd like to do t today, I'm going to uh, introduce our two wonderful speakers. Thank you both for taking the time to come. Um, one of the reasons we uh, thought about this as a committee was that there's so much publicity now about the court systems and the judges and what they're doing and what they're not doing and what they can do. There's a really lot of confusion uh, exactly how can they do what they do and why do they do what they do. So um, we are really honored to have them. Judge Heather Shand is here, and she's a candidate for the Skagit County Superior Court. And Cicely Hazelwood, a candidate for re-election for District 3 of the Washington Court of Appeals Division 1. And we're going to talk about the legal system and why it's so important for democracy. Um, and I'm going to uh, let them introduce themselves. And the mic is there. 
Uh, thank you for having me. My name is Heather Shand. I am currently a court commissioner in Skagit County Superior Court. I am uh, technically judge elect for Department One of Skagit County Superior Court. Judge Brian Stiles is retiring, and I uh, will be taking his seat the second Tuesday in January. Prior to taking the bench in 2019 as a court commissioner, I was in private practice in Mount Vernon, where I had a practice focusing on estate planning, family law, and business. Um, some tax work as well. I used to say I argued over um, children and dead people. Uh, <laughs> so I got through that. I had my own practice yeah, for about 17 years um, back in Mount Vernon where I grew up, born and raised Skagitonian. Prior to that, I was in Seattle um, working for five years, about four years or so, a little bit over. Um, I went to Mount Vernon High School, Conway, Conway Elementary School, Mount Vernon High School, University of Washington for my undergrad degree um, in sociology and political science, Gonzaga University for my um, law degree, and then I received my LLM in taxation, which is a graduate tax degree in law from the University of Washington. So. Needless to say, I believe purple uh, pretty, pretty nicely. Yeah. Thank you for having me. My name is <laughs> Cecily Hazelrig. I'm the acting chief judge of Division One of the Washington State Court of Appeals. Um, I joined the court in January of 2019 after prevailing in a contested election with five candidates across four counties, because why wouldn't that be your first electoral <laughs> experience? As a candidate, it was fine, definitely no tears. Um, but it worked out, and it's been fantastic. Um, and it was, it has been sort of a culmination of what I was doing up to that point. When I was elected to the bench, I was a Skagit County public defender. Um, I was one of a handful of bilingual attorneys um, in the public defender's office, representing people in their primary language, um, if, it was, if it was Spanish, in their secondary language, if they were a speaker of Mexican indigenous languages. Um, I live in Mount Vernon. My daughter just graduated from Mount Vernon High School last month. My other daughter graduated from Skagit Valley College two days prior to that. Um, and, but I grew up on Whidbey Island. I'm an Islander. My parents were Texans who were stationed at Whidbey because of the military base. And I was born on the base and I went to Oak Harbor schools, K through 12. Um, after I graduated high school, I had done the Running Start program at the Whidbey campus of Skagit, but then I started in the paralegal program at Skagit Valley College. And I was actually the first graduate of that program to go on and earn a Juris Doctorate. So after I completed the paralegal program at Skagit, I then went to Fairhaven College at Western Washington University, did a double major, picking up some American cultural studies with a self-designed emphasis in social justice, activism, and law. And so I got to answer, what are you going to do with that? A lot. Um, <laughs> I'm going to represent people without charging them, was the answer. Um, and then I went to Gonzaga Law as well. Um, I studied in Mexico for a semester during, well, I studied in Mexico in undergrad, but I also studied in Mexico during law school at the University of Guanajuato. Um, because I'm a first-gen Chicana attorney, um, I'm the first in the Garcia line of my family with a graduate degree um, and the first to be an attorney. And so it was really, really important to me that I understand the system as well as the language and the culture, particularly because of the demographics of our county. Um, and so I started out doing immigration work up in Whatcom County. I lived in Bellingham for a number of years. I was an adjunct faculty member at Fairhaven College teaching in American cultural studies while I was practicing immigration law. Um, and then it became abundantly clear that I could probably do more help if I could mitigate some of the um, barriers created by criminal convictions. Uh, and that's how I found myself a Skagit County public defender. <laughs> um, while I've been on the bench, I have been as busy as I was before. And so um, I represent the Court of Appeals at the Public Engagement and Education Committee, which is a statewide committee through the judiciary. And I'm the co-chair of the K-12 Civics Education Committee. Um, I also served on the Racial Justice Consortium, which uh, was tasked with looking at the state court system through a race equity lens 
in the wake of the murder of George Floyd and uh, the reforms that were coming out across the country. So um, that's some of what I do at the court. I do a lot more stuff uh, that's kind of nerdy and boring, but this is my most favorite thing because this brings the education and the law together and I get to have conversations with people who are interested in how our systems work and it's um, that civics education piece is just probably one of the best parts of what we get to do um, and so we're really grateful to be here in this community uh, with you and and dive into some of these topics but Judge Election and I have some limitations <laughs> about what we can and cannot talk about. And so before we get into the substance of the conversation, which will hopefully then lead into a Q&A, I wanna talk a little bit about the Code for Judicial Conduct. As judicial officers, we are both sworn to uphold the Code for Judicial Conduct. And if someone thinks we have not, <laughs> we are subject to the Judicial Ethics Commission, for investigation and potentially disciplinary sanctions. So we take this very, very seriously. The Code for Judicial Conduct is available on the Washington Courts website. Because we are law nerds, we both brought our own copies of it with us this evening uh, without having planned that. But I will explain a little bit about what that means in terms of having conversations like these. The, the canons which make up the code for judicial conduct are the behavioral and professional and ethical expectations that are imposed on every single judicial officer in the state of Washington. Whether you are a Supreme Court justice, an appellate court judge, a trial court judge, a pro tem, which means a temporary judge, you are bound to uphold these canons. And canon one, says a judge shall uphold and promote the independence, integrity, and impartiality of the judiciary and shall avoid impropriety and the appearance of impropriety. And Canon 2 says that a judge should perform the duties of judicial office impartially, competently, and diligently. So you heard you know, appearance of impropriety, impartiality. And so one of the things that means when you get into the weeds of the canons is that we are expressly prohibited from discussing our personal opinions about matters which may come before us in our capacity as judicial officers. And we're gonna talk a little bit later about what that means in terms of elections and things like that. but. Please understand that when we get to the Q&A section um, of this evening, if we say we're not able to answer that question, it is not, we are not being disrespectful, uh, we are not being dismissive, we are doing the best we can to uphold these canons because we've both taken oaths and we, you know, take that very seriously. So with that in mind, uh, I will pass the microphone back to Judge Elect Shand to talk a little bit about, um, a little bit more about what that might look like. So I'm gonna talk about the process of how we get elected or appointed to our positions. Um, obviously we, we put in for an, an election just as anyone else who is putting in for an elected position. Um, we file a, a PDC disclosure saying that we want to do this and we then file with the Secretary of State during filing week, right? Just like all other, um, everyone else does. The interesting thing that you're gonna see on this ballot coming up, now that we've both been in front of you today, is that you're gonna see Judge Hazelrig's name on the ballot and you're not gonna see my name on the ballot, which is a fascinating thing, <laughs> right? Why would you not see a Superior Court judge, which we commonly call ourselves the trial judge, um, but you're going to see Court of Appeals and the Supreme Court, even if they don't have an opponent. So the Supreme Court and Superior Court were created by Article 4 of the Washington State Constitution. The Court of Appeals and District Court positions are created by statute that, for some reason, <laughs> Uh, Article 4 uh, specifically states that if a trial judge, Superior Court judge, does not have an opponent, they are automatically elected at the time the candidates are certified. Um, so that's why, technically, it's a judge-elect situation for me, 
versus a candidate. So it's an interesting rabbit hole that we've gone down to figure out why that is. Um, we're not special in any way, it's just the way that the articles were created when the Constitution was created. So that's what you're gonna see on the ballot um, in off years, every up, you know, the two years, um, when district court runs, you see them on the ballot when they're uncontested. But I, I don't, for some reason, you don't see us. So we're just standalone by ourselves. Um, so a little, little education that we um, kind of learned ourselves as well as we prepare for these situations where we are both very involved in our community and we believe, I mean, I can speak for myself, but I'm sure Judge Hazelwood will agree, that part of being a good member of our judiciary is being a good member of our community and knowing the community that we're serving um, and knowing the issues that our community is facing. So it's really important for us that we come out and meet people and that we are known to people and we are able to integrate ourselves into the community. And that is why the canons are so important because historically, um, judges would kind of hide behind the canons and hide behind the robe thinking they're just scared to come out because there's certain things you can't talk about. So it's really important to us that we are here to have a conversation with you about all of the issues that we see, how our, ju how our judiciaries run, um, and have some conversations about things on the federal level that I know you all have interested in that we're gonna get questions on. Um, so just keep those candidates in mind. Um, we have behind us a diagram of how our court system is situated. So we have nine Supreme Court justices. We have, I do math, 23? 22. 22. I don't do math. <laughs> Otherwise I'd be a doctor, I think. Uh, court of Appeals judges, there's 22. Superior Court judges, there's 201. And there's 88 commissioners. So one of the big questions that people ask me all the time is why, what is the difference between a court commissioner and a judge? Because I've been a court commissioner now for almost five years, and that's what people ask. Court commissioners are created by, there's two kinds. One is a uh, constitutional commissioner, and second is a statutory commissioner. Constitutional commissioner serves at, um, and it's created again by Article 4, serves at the pleasure of a judge and has all the same authority as a Superior Court judge. Um, with an exception that we cannot um, sentence a criminal, um, and we can only take pleas when the criminal agrees to, to, that we can take that plea. And obviously a judge can do all of that stuff, right? Um, statutory commissioners have the same, you can have three in your court, um, same powers and authority. If you have over 400,000 people in your community, you can have what's called a criminal um, commissioner that can handle your criminal courts in addition to your statutory and your constitutional commissioners. So I call myself a 90% judge at the moment. So we commonly call ourselves because we can do almost everything, but maybe not quite. District court um, also has commissioners. There's a pretty distinct difference between Superior Court and District Court. As you can see, District Court is underneath Superior Court. We are their appeal. So if you have an issue in District Court, you appeal it to Superior Court. If you have an issue with your Superior Court decision, you're gonna take it up to Court of Appeals. If you have an issue with that decision, you're gonna go to the Supreme Court. District Court is a limited jurisdiction court. It's created by statute as well. Um, they call themselves kind of the Court of the People, I think. A lot of times, if you talk to one of their judges, they handle uh, traffic infractions, they handle gross misdemeanors and misdemeanors. They um, can only handle those um, up to that level. So they can only um, sentence someone to 364 days in jail, which leaves them in the local jail, not going to prison, um, and up to a $5,000 fine. Um, they cannot deal with felonies, which is when you get into Superior Court. Superior Court deals with gross misdemeanors, misdemeanors, and felonies. Civil cases that involve children, real estate, or probate, over $75,000 for any kind of other civil cases. Um, District Court does also deal with civil cases up to $100,000. That's where you see your small claims court. And we have night court here in Skagit County, so if you have small claims court, you're going to go to the night court, which is a fun little thing. 
<laughs> it's a cute little thing. Um, district court judges, their power and authority is limited to that within the state of Washington. Superior court judges, power and authority is nationwide. And that's where the distinction really comes in for your commissioners being um, statutory or constitutional. Because constitutional commissioners, you again, have the full authority. So if I have a warrant that comes in that I need to be, that I need to sign um, for law enforcement, they can take it out of state just as if a judge has signed it, if I've signed it. District court is limited to just the state of Washington unless they've been given specific powers um, by the superior court judges. We're a small community, a small uh, judicial bench, so we do have two district court judges who are authorized to sign nationwide warrants if needed um, across if, if we're not available. In addition, some, Anacortes has one, uh, some towns have municipal courts. Municipal courts deal with infractions. They deal with misdemeanors and gross misdemeanors. They do not do any civil work, no, no civil cases. Those will go to district court. In our community, district court judges have contracts with all of the cities. So you're gonna see a district court judge here as your Anacortes municipal court judge. Um, so the cities and the county have worked out an agreement so that they have the same, four, four of them are handling all four towns as well as district court. So I think right now it's Commissioner Eason. No, yeah, that's right. Yeah, Commissioner Eason is out here in Anacortes for you guys right now. Um, municipal courts are a really interesting animal um, because that's where you really have an interplay in the two branches of government. Because um, the judicial branch of government is a separate branch of government. But in the municipal court, municipal court judges are appointed by the mayor or city council, um, and all of their authority is given to them by the mayor and the city council. Their budgeting is given to them by the mayor and city council, so that, that distinct line where you have the executive branch and the judicial branch um, really gets clouded on the municipal court level. So that puts municipal and district court judges at a real disadvantage um, in being able to try to navigate that. Maybe not disadvantage is not the right word, but um, complicates things, exactly. Versus Superior Court, Court of Appeals, and the Supreme Court, um, we can just tell them, no, we're a separate branch of government. You, you don't get to tell us what to do necessarily, right? Um, we're here to interpret the law and interpret what the legislator, legislative body has decided is the law and determine whether or not it's constitutional um, and how we're going to apply that. In the municipal and district court levels, having that blur makes it harder sometimes for presiding municipal and district court judges to run their courts because there is that blur. But they, um, there's a lot of judicial training at judicial college that really helps municipal and district court judges be able to navigate that, that line. But it's an interesting thing, I think, that a lot of people don't think about is the way that the municipal courts and district court is run versus Superior Court and Court of Appeals and Supreme Court. Anything, anything else I missed in that category? Perfect. Okay, so I will now talk a little bit about the appellate courts and uh, how that works in our state. As Judge Elect Shan indicated, we have the, the next step of review above the superior courts is my court, the Court of Appeals. And as she also indicated, we are a statutorily created court um, that was authorized by the 50th Amendment to the Washington State Constitution, but the statute they didn't work with the legislature to enact the statute until 1969. So it's a relatively new court. And it's kind of a fascinating story about how it came to be because prior to the creation of the Court of Appeals, and again, I say fascinating because I'm a terrible nerd about this stuff, so bear with me. Um, I might have oversold it. Uh, the, the way that our, our appellate review worked in the state of Washington before the creation of the Court of Appeals was that our Supreme Court took every appeal and they sit and bonk, which means all nine of them together. So think about one superior court 
in every county in the state of Washington and all of the litigation that comes out of there and maybe some that trickles up through the district courts going to those nine people and that they have to sit together and decide collectively how to resolve each of those appeals. So what happened was they said, oh, this is awful and we think someone else should maybe sift through some of this first and that way we can focus our attention on the really, really core issues to the state of Washington resolving disputes in terms of application of statutes or case law in different uh, parts of the state, deciding matters of first impression, things like that. So again, collaboration with the legislature, we have this 50th Amendment sitting out there with it ready to go whenever they were ready to move. And so we, we have the passage of the statute. and. The statutory scheme says that there are three divisions and the divisions are divided by geography and population in terms of allocation of judges. However, it is one court of appeals and we are empowered to hear cases from across the state of Washington. I have written opinions coming out of Asotin County and Clark County as well as within Division One. So, Division one is the largest and most populous. We are headquartered in Seattle. We have 10 judges. We are comprised of Skagit, Whatcom Island, San Juan, Snohomish, and King counties. And again, the judges are allocated by geography and population. So of those 10 judges at division one, seven of them are King County judges, <laughs> which should give us no surprise. <laughs> Two of them come from Snohomish County and you have one judge who represents Skagit, Whatcom Island, and San Juan, so that's me. Um, in Division Two, that's Pierce County, south to the Oregon border, west of the Cascades, that's headquartered in Tacoma. And so they have seven judges. And then Division Three is everything east of the Cascades. <laughs> they are headquartered in Spokane, and they have five judges, so it's the smallest court, smallest division. Um, you will often see in our opinions, if we're referring to an opinion issued by another division, we will say another division of this court, or we, you know, we decided, we, we do try to emphasize that we are one court. Um, and so the cases that come out of the Court of Appeals are binding authority across the state of Washington. Some people think that, oh, um, I don't have to listen to what a Division One opinion says because I practice in, you know, um, Kittitas County. Ha, no, um, <laughs> it's binding authority. Um, we are what's called an intermediate appellate court. And so what that means is you know, we're in the middle, right? Uh, we don't have the final say but we do have the, we are tasked with reviewing the work of the trial courts. So what exactly does that mean? Well, everyone who has been convicted of a criminal offense has a right to appeal and at public expense. So every criminal conviction that comes out of every superior court in the state of Washington can be appealed. They're not all appealed, but many, many of them are. And so you have this automatic right to appeal. Then in civil matters, so this could be dissolution cases, this could be estate litigation, this could be personal injury case out of a car accident, it can be involuntary commitment um, for mental health reasons, all manner of other types of, of um, cases also come to the Court of Appeals. Now, certain types where you have liberty interests at stake that are as serious as criminal convictions, so like those mental health convic um, commitments, and also dependencies where the state has terminated parental rights, um, you also have a right to appeal at public expense. But those other things like dissolutions and car accidents, that you can appeal, but 
not at public expense. You have to pay for the attorney, you have to pay for the preparation of the record and the filing fee and that sort of thing. So we take all comers at the Court of Appeals. We don't turn anybody away and we do absolutely unbelievable volume. Um, and I'll talk about numbers in just a minute. The Supreme Court now is freed up to select which cases they will hear. And so we, they call that accepting review. Many, many cases that come out of the trial courts are petitioned for direct review to the Supreme Court. And the majority of the time, a panel of justices reviews that petition and says, yeah, this is actually pretty well settled law. We're gonna send it down to the Court of Appeals. Um, and so that, again, they can focus on the really, really key legal issues in our state, and they can resolve tension. So for example, if we have issued different opinions in the different divisions about a particular law or a particular issue, the Supreme Court can take that and say, eh, <laughs> this is the way that it is. So that's how the Court of Appeals works. And because we are an intermediate appellate court, we are bound by case law. We cannot disregard case precedent. And you might have heard about this in the media in the last couple of years, this concept called stare decisis. It's the thing is decided. We are bound by that at the Court of Appeals. The state Supreme Court can deviate from that and they have special permission with the Constitution that allows them to correct past injustices, for example. And we've seen that a few times with opinions that have come out of our state Supreme Court. Um, for example, there was a case that had to do with segre segregated cemeteries, um, racially restrictive covenants on, um, on properties, things like that. Um, so the Supreme Court, was created with the Washington Territorial Constitution in 1889. At the time, it established five justices. We now have nine. They are elected statewide. So um, as much fun as I had campaigning across four counties, they have to campaign across 39. Um, so, and as I indicated, they, they choose the cases that they hear. And so again, by volume, most of the appeals that are heard in the state of Washington stop at the Court of Appeals. If someone disagrees with the way we have decided an appeal, they can petition for further review to the Supreme Court, but again, they have discretion to deny review. Most of the time, review is denied. So really, for most litigants in the state of Washington, we are the last stop for their case. Um, when, we talk, when I was talking about volume, we have stats that have come out now. Mind you, this is, you know, the volume pre-COVID was significantly higher. Uh, one of the things that happened with shutting down kind of our society was that trial courts were limited in what they could do, which meant we had less inventory of cases to hear, right? So when the trial courts closed down, we see that impact usually about a year and a half later, we see that dip. So mind you, these are post, you know, or, or later COVID numbers. The Supreme Court issued 59 opinions in 2023, so last year. 59 opinions divided amongst the nine justices. In 2023, the Court of Appeals issued 1,210 opinions amongst the three divisions. Division three issued 299 opinions. Division two issued 371. Division one, my court, issued 540. I personally authored 50 opinions last year, and in my role as acting chief, I also reviewed and ruled on an additional 307 personal restraint petitions from people who are incarcerated. So when we say volume, <laughs> we mean volume. Um, but for comparison, in 2020, even though we were shut down and quarantining as an essential you know, government agency, right, as part of uh, one of the branches of government, Division One had issued 770 opinions that year. 
we just modified our processes. Uh, so we are moving and we, um, we are doing what we can to build out what's called the jurisprudence of the state of Washington. The legislature obviously creates our statutes. Our local governments create our codes and our, um, our local legal framework. But another form of law is case law. And so when we interpret a statute and say what it means, or we say, oh no, when this happens, you have to do this, or this is how you apply this evidentiary rule, we are creating law in the state of Washington. So that's the appellate court. <laughs> and then let's see. Okay, so getting to electing judges, right? Judge elect Shand had talked about this um, and will give us some more details about the different ways that this happens. But effectively, the tension between the different approaches to creating judges, if you will, comes down to neutrality versus accountability. Because remember when I read the canons, we talked about impartiality, we, we talked about integrity and those sorts of things. And so when we look at the federal system, we have what are called Article Three judges. Article Three judges are the ones with lifetime appointments who are appointed by the president and then confirmed by the Senate. Um, that comes from Article 3, Section 1 of the United States Constitution. It's called the Vesting Clause. And so I'll read that to you really quickly. The judicial power of the United States shall be vested in one Supreme Court and in such inferior courts as the Congress may from time to time ordain and establish. The judges, both of the Supreme and inferior courts, shall hold their offices during good behavior and shall at stated times receive for their services a compensation which shall not be diminished during their continuance in office. So what does that mean? It means, as I mentioned, a lifetime appointment. And the, the kind of philosophy behind a lifetime appointment is that it would put these federal judges above the fray. If they knew that they were not subject to election or other, um, I guess, methods of removal, if you will, um, that they would be bold enough to, to uh, take an intellectually honest but perhaps unpopular opinion, right? And so that was the thought process behind these lifetime appointments. Now, you'll, you probably noticed that it talked about shall hold their offices during good behavior. And what that means is that even federal Article III judges are subject to impeachment. Um, they can be impeached by the House and you know, convicted by the Senate, uh, the same as, any, as a number of other federal officials. Um, and so that's the, at least you know, kind of philosophical <laughs> Um, aspect of that particular path, right? We're, we're emphasizing neutrality. And so the other value, if you will, accountability, leads us to elections. And the idea is that if you have a judge who is maybe not complying with the canons or just not comporting themselves in the way that the people they are, have been elected to serve expect that that judge can be removed through the electoral process. That's why you have judges on the ballots. All of our superior court judges across the whole state of Washington are on the ballot at the same time. In Skagit County, none of our judges who were seeking re-election drew opponents and Judge-elect Shand was unopposed in filing for Judge Stiles' uh, soon-to-be-vacated seat. But that's what we do in our state, is we subject our trial court judges to re-election every four years. Court of Appeals and Supreme Court justices are up for re-election every six years. And so it, it, the idea is that it keeps us accountable to the voters. Um, so that's the, the philosophical debate, if you will. 
So you may wonder how other states do this, right? So we know how the federal level does it. Um, we all know how that works. Um, but other states, there are a variety of different ways. There's partisan races, which is a shocker to us. There's nonpartisan races, which is what we have here. There's gubernatorial appointments. There's legislative appointments. And then there's a method called the hybrid method. Um, and there's two ways that that works. Four states use the hybrid method, um, which is a governor or a legislative appointment that follows an election. Um, and there's also this other way, which is called the Missouri plan. 14 states use this, and it's interesting. They have a nominating commissioner that works for the governor that creates a group of candidates the governor appoints, and then they are there's a retention election. So it's almost like a vetting process to determine whether or not the candidates are appropriate and qualified, and then you put those candidates before the public and the community, and then they vote. So seven states of 31 that have elections have partisan elections. 24 have nonpartisan elections, which again, that's where Washington falls. Um, 10 states have governor appointments. Two states have legislative appointments. And as, as I said, 14 follow the Missouri plan and four follow the hybrid plan. If we, in Washington state, if you have a situation where a judge retires before their term is up, or for some reason vacates their seat, which the only thing I can think of if they're not retiring is that they have shuffled off the mortal coil, as my ethics professor would say, um, you then go for, a, at the Supreme Court and the Court of Appeals and the, and the Superior Court levels, the governor appoints someone, and there's a vetting process in the state of Washington. There's a pretty thorough application, um, and there's a vetting process, and the governor appoints, and then that person has to run in the next general election to retain that seat. So we kind of follow that hybrid method for purposes of um, putting someone in the seat that has been vacated. District court and municipal court, well, district court, I'll start there. District court, similar method. Um, the county commissioners are the um, body that appoints if someone leaves an office and then they have to run in the next election to retain the seat. And the municipal court, um, they are just by the mayor or city council. They're not elected into their seats. So there's lots of discussion about why um, this should happen, right? We kind of talked about that philosophical discussion. Um, it puts judges at, at times and judicial can, candidates who also have to follow the canons, which I think is a really important aspect for us. As a, as a pro tem judge, a court commissioner, or a, a sitting judge, you have to follow the canons. But when you are running for a judicial office, you also have to follow the canons of judicial conduct. So. Um, if the, we have an attorney running against us, they don't have the right to say things that we cannot say. And as sitting judges, one of the things that I commonly will tell people is that our freedom of speech is a little bit limited. Okay? It's not fully limited, but it's limited to the extent that we would not want to be impartial um, or address something that would be before us. An interesting fact that I found when I was preparing for today is that um, three states appoint trial judges for their lifetime. Massachusetts appoints until the person passes away. New Hampshire and uh, uh, Rhode Island are up to the age of 70. In the state of Washington, judges have to retire uh, in the year they ha at the end of their 75th birthday year. So. If you turn 75 on January 2nd, you can go to the end of that year. If you turn 75 on November 30th, you have one more month until you have to vacate your seat. So we do have a cap. Um, we kind of have already talked a lot about the um, canons, but I want to talk for a second about how those canons of judicial conduct interplay with an election. Um, and we have obviously the PDC restrictions like all other candidates for offices across the state have, which is the Public Disclosure Commission. Um, but in addition to that, we have the canons of judicial conduct, right? So certain things that we can and cannot do, we cannot use our title on the ballot 
or in our materials necessarily, right? So we can't say re-elect. Well, you can say re-elect. Yeah, you can. But you can't. Yeah. Um, but you cannot put on the ballot Judge Cecily Hazelrig. It only says Cecily Hazelrig, right? Her materials can say re-elect Judge Hazelrig, but you cannot be on the ballot, okay? Um, we cannot necessarily use our positions in, to further our own interest. So this is where pictures in our robes become an issue if it's not clear that we are either a sitting judge or commissioner or that we are not using the robe in any way to try to gain anything from it. That's a huge issue. That's pretty settled, but it is a little unnerving when you are a sitting judge and you may have a restriction on being able to wear your robe. You cannot use public funds or anything that the public paid for in your election, right? That seems like a no-brainer. But the robes that we wear, we don't pay for them. You guys do, right? So the robes we wear, we cannot wear our robes. You can buy our own, but you can't wear your own um, when you are in a campaign. We are not allowed to be in the room when money is talked about. So you can invite us to your homes and throw us a party because you want to help us in a campaign, which, thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> but when it comes time to ask for the ask to help us on this endeavor that's very, very expensive, we can't be there. So we have to exit, exit stage left. Um, we cannot personally thank any of our donors, which to me feels really weird. But technically we're not supposed to know who our donors are. Because no, it's probably available on the PDC. Correct. And we have to sign the PDC. Right. <laughs> Saying it's accurate. Correct. Um, and so it gets us in a real weird quandary that other candidates don't have, right? That if you come before me and you've donated to me, do I have to disclose that to the other side if I know? Because that goes to impartiality and bias, right? Is there an appearance of fairness there? If you had a street, uh, had one of my signs in your yard and you came before me, do I have to disclose that to the other side because I know that you supported my campaign? There's no clear answer on that. It's about whether or not we believe that it creates an appearance of fairness issue. And so we have to disclose and potentially recuse off of a case if someone believes that that creates an appearance of fairness issue or an impropriety. Um, we cannot take any kind of PAC funds at all. Uh, so we do have that restriction. We are limited, uh, we are limited on who we can talk to and when we can talk to them. So. We cannot come and talk, go to a political gathering unless we are currently in campaigns. It doesn't matter if it's our family or our friends. We could be friends with um, Deborah Lekhanoff. We can't go to one of her events, even if we're her friend. We can't endorse anyone who is other than a judicial candidate for office, partisan or nonpartisan, family or not. My dad is a, a commissioner on the hospital in Skagit County. I couldn't endorse him on his endorsement list when he was on the campaign trail because I'm a sitting judicial officer. Feels weird, but again, we can't be involved in political activities. So we, we say these things because when we are out campaigning, which thank goodness we're not, um, uh, we, we're limited in what we can do. And to the public, that might appear that judicial officers and candidates are being a little shady maybe, or trying to hide the ball, and that's not the case at all. Um, obviously, as we stated before, we are prohibited from making any kind of public comments on issues that other candidates are openly talking about. So abortion, we can't talk about it because that can come before us at any time. We can't tell our personal opinion um, or really even talk about what the law is. Uh, we can't talk about elections, right? We can't talk about 
ballot issues, any of those things, because they would come before us. We are not allowed to help in the election process in Skagit County. Skagit County sends out an email every campaign year, every election. We need help at the ballot counting, so any employee of Skagit County can come help. No employee from a court in Skagit County can help, because that would be us appearing to be involved in the election that we may have to resolve if that comes up. Um, so campaign funds are a really, really, really big deal. And Judge Haleberg is going to talk about that here in a second. But that's really the biggest um, difficulty that we have. It's very, very expensive to run a campaign, as everyone knows. Um, and our restrictions are, are hard because we can't ask for money. We have to rely upon other people to do it for us. Um, but those are kind of the interplays that the PDC has on, on us um, as judicial officers for the canons as they they kind of weave between, so. As Judge-elect Shand um, indicated, we are only permitted to run as nonpartisan candidates, and in an increasingly polarized political world, that is a challenge, right? And even if someone says, um, oh no, I'm nonpartisan, then you can usually ask follow-up questions about subjects that are important to you and figure out where someone's kind of ideological, you know, um, fault lines are, if you will. Um, but again, we're prevented from, from doing that. We are permitted to seek endorsements from political parties, provided that we are actively seeking endorsement from both parties. Um, and so um, what often happens is that maybe one party over the other responds to those requests when the other one chooses not to inquire further or yeah, otherwise follow up. Um, we can accept endorsements from partisan candidates. And as Judge-elect Shand indicated, we are prevented from endorsing them. And so it becomes a little bit awkward because you get to know people um, when you're running a particular contested election and you're out doing candidate forums and, and whatnot. And you become friendly with people. And then when it's time for re-election, you say, hey, do you remember me? Would you be willing to endorse me now that you're in the state Senate? And they go, yeah, great. Would you you know, reciprocate? I can't. <laughs> Most of the time, though, um, folks understand. Um, they understand that as uh, judicial officers, we have these extra sets of rules. And, and um, folks are overwhelmingly very understanding about that particular dynamic and why it's important. Um, and again, the fundraising rules are extraordinarily critical. You can accept money from parties, for example, um, has endorsed you as their candidate. Um, you might have access to resources that should be reported as in-kind donations. You might even get a, a monetary donation. Um, you can receive that, but you have to really think hard about the optics. And you have to really think hard about, you know, that's going to be on the PDC. Um, and so it gets it gets very tricky. And, and I'll be candid that when I was running for election in 2018, um, unfortunately for my dear, dear consultants, most of my campaign committee was made up of attorneys. So that made their lives extra miserable. Um, because when I tell you we would litigate to death the question of whether we should put something on our website, put it on a walk piece, do we accept this donation when we need the resources, but what is, is that going to rub up against the canons? Um, it, it becomes very, very complicated. Um, and at the end of the day, uh, my position was, even if I'm ultimately never elected to this office, as Judge Elekshand indicated, I was bound by the canons regardless. Um, and at the end of the day, I was the one who was going to get hauled up in front of the Judicial Ethics Commission. So uh, my word was the final one when it came to making those decisions. Um, and I think that's part of the reason that it 
contested judicial elections are so rare in our state because they're very difficult um, to, to manage. I was making notes um, when we were kind of talking earlier about the state court system. So as we indicated, there are 22 Court of Appeals judges in the state of Washington. Of those 22, three of us earned our seats by contested election. Two of them were elected in uncontested elections. And the remaining, what would that be? Don't make me do math. I also went to law school. Thank you. Um, were appointed by a governor and then ran what we call a retention race. And so that's the way that this works in Washington state. As Judge Elect Shand indicated, when there is a vacancy during a term, the, under the Constitution, the governor appoints the replacement. And I, I'm smirking about that because that became an issue in a contested judicial election last year. There was a candidate who said, you know, I just don't like these judicial appointments. And that's a fair critique, right? Um, I, you know, but I have concerns about the governor doing this. And that's fine. But the governor's authority to do that comes from our state constitution in very plain language. Um, so the, by the governor appointing a number of judges, they're not acting out of, um, in, a, in a way that's improper. They're acting in a manner that is completely consistent with the founders of our state and how they wanted this process to unfold. However, to still bring us back to that accountability piece, what happens is the next filing period after appointment, that judge must run a retention race to see if the electorate wants to keep them. <laughs> and they may draw a challenger. And so when you are appointed, can have a big impact on what your next two years of your life is going to look like. For example, we had a judge at our court who was appointed in March, which is before the May filing period. So they were learning how to be a judge and six weeks later or something like that, had to file with the Secretary of State with the PDC and run a retention race and then the term that they were filling expired a year later and then they ended up running it. So, so you might find yourself you know, captive uh, by, by time, um, but the reality is that most judicial elections in the state of Washington, particularly those after appointment, are not opposed. Um, and so most of the complicated things that we've been talking about tonight don't generally come to pass unless it is a contested election. Um, something else I was gonna say about contested elections and judges, and it'll probably come back to me. Um, so how on earth do you decide who to vote for in a judicial election, right? This is the question that we hear all the time. And you know, there was discussion about the voter's guide um, at the beginning of the meeting. I am one of those people who highlights and annotates my voter's guide and it's on the coffee table and I do dramatic readings aloud for my children who I'm sure are thrilled. Um, and, um, and I go back to it again and again and I, I review it and so when I was writing my statement in 2018, I felt pressed for time and I didn't feel like I'd given it enough, uh, you know, edits and revisions because, you know, I'm an appellate judge. Um, and so we, but my friend said, oh, you know, nobody reads those things. And I said, I read those things. I read it so much and so many times. Um, and so, you know, it is really important. It gives the very tiny little glimpse that we get to give about who we are. So one of the things that I talked about in my last election cycle was endorsements, particularly endorsements of other judicial officers. I think that that can be a very useful tool for voters um, because I think you can get a sense of where people's um, community involvement is, where their professional practice is, um, by looking at their endorsements. Um, 
I have actively sought out endorsements from everyone, regardless of whether they have a title. To me, community member endorsements are just as impactful, if not more so, than people involved in politics. Um, because what that means is that person um, who has this incredible responsibility of deciding what their government looks like has decided they want me there. Um, judicial endorsements of other judicial candidates, I think, again, is extraordinarily important. The, the message that I had in 2018, um, and again, as I was preparing for what was expected to be a contested race this year, was who else knows what it takes to be a good judge but other judges? And particularly when I was running in 2018, there were, um, when it got down to the general, it was myself and another attorney, both out of uh, Skagit County. And so I said, you know, these, my, my local trial court judges, those endorsements meant the most to me because they were the ones who saw me day in and day out as a public defender. They saw how I litigated, they saw how I wrote, they saw how I thought about the law, how I treated my clients how I treated witnesses, how I treated opposing counsel, how I treated court staff. Those people have the, the deepest and broadest insights into whether or not I have a judicial demeanor and the work ethic and um, kind of intellectual curiosity to do that job. And so I think looking at endorsements is an incredibly powerful tool for voters when they're trying to decide. I think looking at work experience is important. You can start to see if there's value alignment um, based on work history. I think volunteer and community service is extraordinarily important to look at. How involved is this person in making their neighborhood, their community a, a just place outside the courtroom? Right? What sort of work are they doing on the ground? How are they giving back? Because at the end of the day, even if someone is a first-gen attorney, an attorney working in legal aid, where you notoriously don't make a lot of money, you still have an incredible amount of privilege because of that JD and because of that bar number, right? You, we, court is civic ceremony and that it is baked into the founding of this country and people who are admitted to the bar to participate in that civic ceremony have worked hard to get there and are held to different standards the rules of professional conduct um, and and so even if we have not come from you know legacy and and you know all sorts of financial uh, resources we are still very privileged and so what we do with that privilege is an important thing to look at so those are kind of my big um, pointers for how to select judicial candidates when you have um, a contested election and then one of the things that i ran into when i ran a contested election um, in 2020 as well as writing the voter pamphlet statement which you will not see um, for this election. All that hard work, it's okay. I Not wasted, it's all character development. Uh, it is. We have a very limited amount of space. And for those candidates that are running for these positions, take the time to look at their website. Um, and I agree with Judge Hazelrig. Endorsements are hugely important because they tell you more about the person and their involvement um, than anything else. When you see your friend or your neighbor has endorsed them, that tells you a little bit about them, right? It gives you some insight. Being a judge or a court commissioner um, is very hard work. And I think that sometimes people forget how hard the work is. The volume that Judge Hazelwood talked about on the Court of Appeals level is huge. You know, in 2020, that's two cases a day that they were churning out. Um, and that's a lot of work. The trial courts have huge volumes as well, obviously day to day, in and out. We hear hundreds of cases a week. You can't do that without being intellectually curious 
hardworking and intelligent. And the way that you treat people is the most important part about being a judge. You have to be kind, you have to listen, and you have to really make them feel that they've been heard. That is what access to justice is. And that's one of the most important characteristics that you can look for in a judge, is someone who is kind, and their temperament is such that they are not reactive, they're not volatile, um, and that they will listen. Regardless of the time constraints, um, I can have a calendar that has 50 cases on it, and I only have two hours and 45 minutes. That time pressure cannot get to me. I have to still allow each individual to speak to me and tell their side. And I have to listen and explain my ruling and do so with compassion and empathy if I can and educate them, similar to how we educate the community when we go out to talk in the community. And community involvement, is, for me, is the biggest part. Um, I came back to give back, is what I say. I came back to where I grew up to give back to the community. And so that's a huge characteristic for me. But the biggest part about choosing a candidate is finding someone that resonates with you. Um, but it does obviously take a little bit more digging to figure that out. How, how and why do you see sometimes on, a, on the ballot that we're at the very end? Right? What we think is the most important pieces of our government are at the very end. Your county commissioners, your city council members, your fire district commissioners, your judges are at the end of the ballot and can oftentimes get overlooked, especially in this upcoming election where, I mean, how many governor candidates do we have? 28. Right? So by the time you get through that part of the ballot, you're tired. But the most important people to vote for are those who are making decisions about the streets you walk on, those who are making decisions about your case that comes before them. You know, your child who is being taken by the state and put in a foster home, or your mother's estate that you're trying to administer, right? We are the ones that are making decisions on your day-to-day -day lives, as well as your city council members um, and your county commissioners. 95% of the cases that are heard are heard on the trial court level. That's a lot. Yeah, we're at the end. So it's really important to get down there and make sure that you're reading all the way through. Um, or start there. <laughs> Flip the ballot upside down and start there. Uh, so we hope that you have gained a little bit of insight into our judicial system. It's complicated. It's deeply rooted in history. Um, but I love what I do. I know that Judge Hazelrick does as well. Um, and I really love coming out and talking to the community. So thank you for having us today. I'm, I'm going to make a quick pitch and just remind everyone that both our federal and state constitutions guarantee the right to open courts, which means our courts are our courts. And if you are curious about what is happening, you can just go and sit and watch. Or log into Zoom. Or log into Zoom. And in my case, you can tune into TVW. That was one of the COVID holdovers. Um, we created that as, a, as an open courts issue that TVW live streams our argument. Um, it had an amazing benefit of contributing to civics education across the state and also an access to justice issue because incarcerated people who have their appeals heard are not transported to our court so they usually don't even get to see what's happening but now if they're incarcerated they can watch the proceedings they can watch the argument we are extraordinarily popular in barbershops and prisons apparently um, <laughs> and i'll make a quick pitch one of the roles that i have is like i said i represent the court of appeals on the public engagement and education statewide committee and I am the co-chair of the statewide K-12 Civics Education Committee, um, collaborating with our state law librarian, Rob Mead. We run two very critical programs that I would love to see more action on in Skagit County. One of them is called Judges in the Classroom, and it's exactly what it sounds like. It works on putting local judges into court or classrooms <laughs> to talk to kids about our judiciary. We have ready-made 
uh, lesson plans for all levels of public school, um, or we can tailor a lesson plan at the request of a teacher. Um, so we administer that program. We also run an annual program with the legislature called Legislative Scholars, and we're actually doing that next week. And that is where K through 12 educators from across the state travel to Olympia for an intensive civics education program with the legislature. And so they spend four days with the legislators and one day with the judiciary. And so this year, our theme is, no surprise, courts and the electoral process. Because when those teachers go back to school in September, they're gonna be facing questions from students of all ages about the courts and about the increasing activity of um, litigation around the electoral process. We know that there were some 60 lawsuits filed as a result of the last presidential election. My court decided a, an election fraud appeal within the past couple of weeks. They took argument earlier in the summer. I was not on the panel, um, but we continue to see litigation about election integrity, which is why, as Judge Election mentioned, we cannot um, volunteer. And finally, I will pitch traveling court. One of the things that I did when I came to Division One is I revived our traveling court program. And what that does is it takes our court into the communities we serve. We don't want everyone to always have to come to downtown Seattle. I love to come home. So in June of last year, we were at Skagit Valley College's Mount Vernon campus taking live oral argument on a number of cases. This past April, we were at Western Washington University and returned to Skagit Valley College um, at the end of May. And so look for us, and perhaps I'll share information with Ms. Cooper, um, because Skagit Valley College in particular is looking to make that an annual program and perhaps alternating between the Woodby and Mount Vernon campuses. So it's your court. Go watch. <laughs> Too, for me personally, um, I will, I'm happy to take personal questions too about like path to the bench, how did you get there, why did you do this, <laughs> those sorts of things. If it's too personal, I'll tell you, but I'm kind of an open book in that regard, so. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you to uh, state your name and then uh, speak into the mic so we can hear your questions. Uh, my name is Doug and my question is, this is what you were going to get to is how do you learn to be a judge a and how do you become a skilled judge by avoiding trial and error that is a fantastic question um, one of the great things about Washington State is that every judge and commissioner correct within the first 12 months, so it kind of depends on when you become a judicial officer, is required to attend judicial college. And judicial college is a program put on once a year. Um, and so luckily for me, it happened in February, so I took my oath in January and I was in Vancouver the next month. Um, but you know, you might be a judge for 11 months before you go to judicial college. Um, and so you're required to do that. Um, there are different, different ways that courts approach that. One of the ways that we approached it at Division One, and we have now spread that to the other three divisions, is um, one of my now retired colleagues created a new judge orientation lead and appointed me. Um, and so I created a, an orientation curriculum for all new judges at Division I. Um, and then a court-wide committee was created with representatives from the other two divisions where they adopted my curriculum. 
Um, and so we have a structured program learning how to be an appellate court judge. Um, I have put four new judges through this orientation program in the last uh, year and a half. I guess no, by now it's been about two years because um, we've had a tremendous wave of retirements. So we've had we've seen a massive turnover in the courts. Um, not every court uh, has the benefit of a formalized program. Oftentimes there's mentorship, um, but you kind of take the oath and are just put out there. That the requirements for a judge are, are quite minimal. Um, I think I had hesitation about becoming an appellate court judge, taking all of those sorts of cases when my specialty was very much criminal law. But what I found was if I took the same approach to my cases at the Court of Appeals that I took as a public defender, you don't get to pick your cases, they just come to you, right? And you have to do research and you learn the law and you learn particular motions and you address the evidence of that case. It's the same thing, but I've had to work really, really hard to learn areas of law that uh, I never practiced in. But the beautiful thing about the Court of Appeals in particular um, is you sit in panels of three judges. So no one judge is ever gonna go off the rails. <laughs> if they go off the rails, they're gonna end up writing a dissent which has no precedential value. <laughs> so um, they're just saying what they think the law should be, but the majority decides the case. And so the beautiful thing is when you have a judge who used to be a family law prosecutor and a judge who used to be a public defender and a judge who used to do insurance defense, you're gonna get fascinating different perspectives and different areas of expertise that complement each other and you get really robust legal analysis, but again, you also sort of have uh, breaks <laughs> built in. So the trial court is a little bit <clears throat> different. I was sworn in uh, the day I was sworn in in the morning and heard a calendar and then had my formal swearing in in the afternoon, right? I was just off to the races when I became a commissioner. I too went to judicial college. Judicial college is a boot camp for uh, pretty much everything that you're going to need, right? They just give you snippets of every area of law. Um, it's tiring, uh, but it is really robust. The um, administrative office of the courts has been working on a system online to do modules to allow um, kind of nuts and bolts where you can log in. We have access to what's called inside courts and there are bench cards on there that give us a breakdown of any findings we need to make, any colloquies we need to do. A colloquy is um, kind of a required dialogue that we have with the parties on the record. Um, very important in constitutional cases where you have rights of liberties that we've talked about earlier that we need to make sure that you understand what you're doing. Um, so there's these modules you can go and watch, right? And the Superior Court Judges Association has also worked on some aspects of judicial education. We're pushing really hard. Um, every year we have a conference where it's substantive law that we're learning. Um, and every year there's an all courts conference, which is kind of more broader stroke above, above the fray type um, discussions of policy. So you're, in, in my court, which is a court of general jurisdiction, I can hear a guardianship case on a Friday and I will hear a dependency case on a Tuesday. And in between I hear domestic cases. Um, so it's a lot of law and not all of it that we know. You, that's why intellectual curiosity is so important and hard work ethic is really important um, because you have to get in there and do the work. You have to have the curiosity to say, wait, that doesn't make sense. There must be a law. And you have to have the ability to ask the questions. Even if you think the question is stupid, you have to ask it. And all the judges who I have worked with have always been very open about answering the question. Um, prior to taking the bench, I did pro tem work, um, both in district court and in superior court, so I got an idea of what it was like. Um, and I also took courses at the uh, National State College. So there's a national judicial college that you can take courses with other judges across this, the country. Um, and so some people take some of those to fill in the gaps as well. 
in the interim because judicial college does not give you all the information you need they just give you kind of the roadmap of where to go um, but it can be really really overwhelming um, but very gratifying as well when you and very challenging for me i had been practicing about 20 years before i went on the bench and so this was an, another way to challenge my mind and stay on top of the law and give back at the same time so there's no real answer to how do we do it. Um, the hardest part is learning the judicial demeanor. And one of my mentors told me, after two years, you'll feel like you can handle pretty much, you, you feel comfortable. After five years, you feel like you can handle anything that comes in front of you. And the biggest thing that I tell new um, judges or commissioners that come on is don't be scared to take a break. Don't be scared to use a lifeline. I call it a lifeline. Like on who wants to be a millionaire, right? Phone a friend. Uh, judges across the state. So we have 39 counties. We have 201 judges and 88 commissioners. Any of them that I meet on these various meetings that we have, I tell them, if you have a question, email me. If, if a question comes in when I'm on the bench and it's emergent, I will walk off and help them. That's the kind of collegiality we have because it's so important what we do, the decisions that we make. And it's okay to not know the answer and it's okay to say, I'm gonna take this at the end of the calendar or I'm gonna have you come back next week and rule. Um, you gotta be courageous enough to say, I don't know, but I'm gonna find the answer. Also, attorneys are supposed to tell you the law, right? That's their job. Our job is to make sure they're telling us it correctly and make sure they're not missing something and then apply that to the facts. Um, so it's also okay for us to say, please tell me what you want and why, and if you're not giving it to me, please brief it and we'll come back. We try to avoid that as much as we can because we don't want people to have to come back continuously. If they have attorneys, it costs them money, and we recognize that. Um, it also costs them time to come back. But we want to get it right because I don't want to get a love note from the Court of Appeals. I mean, I do. I want one that says I'm right. <laughs> But I like to avoid having them go up in the first place. I do dependency work in our court. Um, so when the state is asking for kids to be removed, so I have quite a few love notes because they do go up. Um, but I'm proud of the work I've done there. And I didn't know that area of law when I took the bench at all. I did not do any of that work at all. So I was immersing myself on a daily basis as cases were going. And you just get better at it and you master your trade, I guess. But there's never a dull day because there's always something new, which is exciting. And this this model is also built into that process, right? So if you're in district court and you don't think that your rights were upheld, that the law was followed, you don't think justice was reached, you can appeal to the superior court under what we call Rauch. Um, and then the superior court then you have the potential to pursue that further. If you feel that the judge misapplied the law or that there was a problem in superior court, then it comes to us. And so, and then if you think that we didn't do it right, then you take it to the Supreme Court. So that's why we have these layers of review. My name is Corrine Salcedo. One of you mentioned that judges are at the end of the ballot. Why is that, do you know? Is there a certain reason for it? I don't, I didn't find a, a reason, but I think it's this. You start on the federal level, right, at the highest, and then you trickle your way down. So you start federal, state, local. So when you look at your ballot, that's kind of what I was opining when I was preparing for today, because I was like, why is that? That's kind of not the most brilliant thing in the world. Um, and so that's kind of what I, I, I opined at the end, was that it just goes by federal, state, local. So you'll have you know, even county before city. So I think that's why. That's all. But flip it upside down. That's what I say. Are there any other questions? Yes. Okay. So wh where do juries factor into this? Before they get to you? Before they get to her? Well, either of you. They're me. Yeah, they're her. They're me. Um, so we, district court and municipal court and superior court are the trial courts, right? So in municipal court and district court, you get a jury of six. 
uh, in Superior Court, you get a jury 12, unless you're doing an ITA and then you get a jury of six. You know, there's little exceptions here and there. Um, so my court does the jury, uh, the jury cases. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. And I will say that because we are both former litigators, we could not have done our jobs then, nor could we do them now were it not for people participating in jury service. This is an incredibly um, important sort of civic duty. Um, and I think it's an amazing opportunity to, again, have a really close up look at this branch of government that is, you know, can be perplexing. Um, so I know the statutory daily compensation is atrocious and I know that it can very much be a hardship, but I will always encourage people to respond to their jury summons because that really is what keeps things going. And our constitution talks about a jury of our peers. So our peers have to show up in order for that constitutional promise to be upheld. On the jury compensation, um, I will share this with you. I am on the um, Superior Court Judges Association uh, Committee. I'm the co-chair of the Family Juvenile Law Committee um, as well as on the Equality and Fairness Committee. And on the Equality and Fairness Committee, we have been talking um, a lot about the jury compensation. $10 a day, right? That's not a lot. And here, you don't have to worry about paying for parking. That's one benefit. Uh, so we've done a lot of research on what happened and why did that happen. Well, back when $10 was instituted, um, it was more than minimum wage for a full day's work, right? But it has not grown with inflation. So there's a pilot project that's currently being operated out of Pierce County through some grant funding to try to do a study to determine whether or not we get broader uh, jury, so jury pools of folks that are more representative of those who are being tried before them, right? The cases that are being tried. Um, with the hope that we can get family members who have children who need to put them in daycare or folks that work. Some employers pay for jury duty, some don't. Um, so we really do see that we have a limited pool based upon the economic constrictions of the pay. Uh, so hopefully they're going to be doing $100 a day as the pilot project in Pierce County. We're going to get some solid numbers to go back to uh, the BJA, which is the Board for Judicial Administration. There's all kinds of acronyms in the law. It's really perplexing at times. Um, and see if we can get more funding from the legislature on that level. But it would be a statewide level. Um, we are what's called um, a, not a unified court system. So this is actually fascinating. I've learned after being on the bench, 39 counties, none of us do it the same, right? Nobody does it the same. So we have the administrative office of the courts that oversees us. We have the Supreme Court that creates our court rules. But if you're practicing in multiple counties, for instance, I would practice in Snohomish, Island, Whatcom, and Skagit, every court did things differently. And you never knew what result you were gonna get coming out of a court. And as a lawyer, it's really hard to advise your client on what the outcome could potentially be, um, unless you knew the judicial officer. So being a non-unified court system, we have to ask for legislative funds on a larger scale versus having 39 counties go say, give me more money, give me more money, right? We go to our commissioners in the county. That's where our funding comes from. Some funding comes from the state level. Judges are paid um, half by the state, half by the county, but it's kind of a hybrid financial system. So the Board of Judicial Administration deals with those larger issues in collaboration with the administrative office of the court. And the Supreme Court runs that Board of Judicial Administration. So having these pilot projects in these counties and giving us some solid numbers is gonna give us more of a, um, a voice to say, we need to increase the jury funds so that we increase our jury pool so that our litigants can be getting a jury of their peers, right? 
um, which is extremely important. So that is on the horizon, uh, and hopefully we'll have updates as it's just starting in Pierce County. Absolutely. I think that the complications are even more than just <clears throat> the, the canons. It's also um, finances is a big aspect, a big issue. Um, we both have had campaign managers and campaign consultants that help us navigate all of those kind of twists and turns and pitfalls that we can fall into, because this is, is, we're doing this on top of our real jobs, right? So while we're out campaigning or preparing for a campaign, which for me started a year before filing, because I knew that Judge Stiles was retiring and I, I had been through a contested campaign in the past and I knew that that hard work in the beginning will help. Um, you do that in addition to everyday hearing cases and raising kids. We're both single moms and we raise daughters on our own in addition to being on the bench and running a campaign. And that puts a, a burden on our kids, um, it puts a burden on our parents, it puts a burden on us. But we are very fortunate to have extremely supportive benches around us. Um, and it is a community of, of great people, um, but I think it's a really scary endeavor to put yourself out there as well. Um, because you are going to put yourself out in a vulnerable position. People are going to tell you things you don't want to hear. Um, and you have to go into it with a growth mindset that this is going to make you a stronger, better person and a better jurist overall. Um, otherwise, why put yourself through it? It's, it's, I think it's absolutely daunting. I waffled with my decision to file in 2018 up until the very last minute, and I told very few people um, because I recognized what it was going to involve. Um, I mentioned at the beginning that I'm a first-gen uh, Chicana attorney. Um, I also happen to be the first Latinx judge on the Washington State Court of Appeals in the history of our state. Um, and which was pretty cool. I did not know what was happening at the time. But what that meant was that I faced different levels of criticism. As women, we face different levels of criticism. As very young looking women, we face different levels of criticism, <laughs> obviously. Um, but um, I was told I was too young. Um, I was told I did not have the right experience. Um, I was explicitly told that the only reason I was going to win was because I was the affirmative action candidate. After I had won, but before I took my oath, I had anonymous calls on my campaign phone telling me that the other candidate was more qualified, I had no business there, um, I didn't belong in that space. I have, at Division I, been mistaken for a law clerk, which is uh, cute but I have too many gray hairs and too much cynicism uh, to be, for that to be a realistic belief, but right? But the idea behind that mistake is judges look a certain way, right? Um, I, right, that's exactly right, used to, but that we're still addressing that perception of who is appropriate for this work, who is qualified for this work. Um, I had people in my community ask me to run for that seat, and I thought that's so sweet. That's, I would never know. I don't like putting myself out there. I can advocate for marginalized, indigent, disenfranchised people with every ounce of my being all day long. Advocating for myself <laughs> is a very different situation and you are putting yourself out there for scrutiny. 
um, the financial considerations were huge. At the end of the day, what I decided in 2018 was, okay, what's gonna happen if I do this? I'm potentially gonna lose sleep and some money. I'm a public defender and a mom. I don't have money or sleep. What is really gonna be different at the end of the day? I don't wanna be 80 years old saying, what if? What if? Did I pass that by? Did I lose an opportunity to push myself and grow and serve my community in a way that I knew I was capable of and that I knew I would love? I knew that I did not know receiverships and dependencies, <laughs> but I knew that I had the work ethic and the curiosity to put in the time to learn it and, and not just learn it, but to master it. Um, and so it, it was a huge obstacle. There were many, many obstacles, and it was very daunting. Um, but I've done big, bold, arguably stupid things many, many times in my life, starting out being a 19-year-old single mom going to school. Um, so this, the worst thing that would have happened if I had lost that election was would have learned about my community in different ways, right? That's like, how is that a bad thing? I was good at my job, I loved my job, I was doing good work in my job. If I stayed at my job, I probably would have been just fine. Um, but there are lots of social, financial, systemic barriers for, for people to run. And I think that it's our responsibility um, if we want to see that look different, to extend invitations to people, right? I have people saying, you should do this. I had never thought about myself this way in a role like this. When I went to law school, I never in a million years said, I'm going to be the acting chief judge of the second highest appellate court in the state of Washington. Never in a million years. I didn't see myself that way because I didn't see people like me there, right? Um, and so, but it was that extension of invitation that caused me to start to go, what if? And so I think extending invitations and encouraging people who you know in the community, who you believe in, and think have characteristics and ideas that can benefit all of us, really encouraging them and Financial support helps absolutely without question, but also logistical support, you know, helping them sit down and fill out a Secretary of State <laughs> filing form, right? Um, helping them figure out a PDC filing, a C1. Um, be their mentor, be their friend, be their support. I think those are really, really important and very tangible things that we can do um, if we want to help people kind of overcome those, those barriers. Um, before we move to the one question, one of the things that we've both been involved in is called the Color of Justice program that we started this year, and the Equality and Fairness Committee through the SCJA that I'm on has been funding that in local courts where we bring in um, judges from all walks of life, all paths to get to the judiciary, and we have high school students come in and show them what the bench looks like because either A, they can't see it, or B, they don't see it in the community they're in, right? Um, and so I think that what, what Judge Hazelberg is saying is that um, it's really important for us to create a bench that is representative of the people, similarly to how we're creating jury pools that are a jury of the peers, right? Um, we have to think about what our community is comprised of, and we, on, on a higher level, are trying to really create that in the communities to allow opportunities for kids um, to see that on, in our court system. So we both have been involved in that, um, and we, we were super proud to do that in our court here locally back in, what, March? Mm -hmm. What was that called? Again? Color of Justice. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, Drew Hill, I, this is a question directly related to what you were just speaking to. So where are we at now as far as the way Washington State bench looks, as far as diversity, you know, um, male, female judges? Uh, 
cultural backgrounds? Mm -hmm. Well, I can tell you in our current court that we sit and serve for you, um, we have six judicial officers, two men and four women, four women under the age of 50, right? Um, and the two, well, I'm replacing one of them, Judge Stiles, and the other one is Judge Verge. Prior to that, we had one woman, Judge Cook, Susan Cook from Anacortes, if I all know her. She was the first female Superior Court judge in Skagit County. Um, and Diane Goddard was the first female judge in District Court, and she took the bench 15 years ago. Yeah, so it's been a huge swing since those two took the bench. So our court locally is changing drastically. Um, if you look at the Supreme Court of the, of, of the state of Washington, um, do you have you written them down? There's nine. Right. So we do that. Yeah. So we have two male justices and seven women. Seven women. Mm -hmm. Our chief justice is Latinx. Latinx. Um, we have two LGBTQ identified justices. One African American, one two one. LGBTQ. Oh, oh, one Asian Pacific. Um, is she Asian? Justice U is Latinx. And the first um, American Indian justice in our state. Um, from Wacom. From Wacom, Justice Montoya Lewis. Yeah. So on that level, we're pretty diverse, right? Yes. Could we take that national? <laughs> <laughs> You're really going to push us, aren't you? I was just going to go to Division One next. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, um, I'm trying to think. So at Division One, I got, I got to look at our numbers. Um, we have the first African American appellate court judge in the state of Washington, Lori K. Smith. She's amazing and brilliant, and wonderful. Um, we have two Asian American women judges. We have me, and um, we have another Latinx judge in King County who joined the court about a year and a half ago. Um, we have, I think about how to count the guys. <laughs> I think we're back to a five and five split when I joined the court. Uh, we were a majority female court. Um, we have two judges of color at Division Two and none at Division Three. Um, I had the privilege of sitting on a panel of all three women of color judges at Division One some years back with Judges Smith and Coburn. That was amazing. And, really impactful for us. Um, we call, well, not we call, the, the gender divide on the bench has been referred to as the gavel gap. Um, and, it, and when you're looking at gender representation, we're doing a lot better than ethnic representation. Um, and the trick becomes, and, and we've heard this as criticism at the federal level and elsewhere, that if you're focusing on a person's ethnicity or gender or sexual identification or some other uh, personality characteristic, then you're, you're prioritizing that over their experience, their demeanor, all of those other things. Um, what I, I told uh, one of my colleagues when I came to Div 1, because he'd asked me, he said, you know, are you Latina? You didn't really advertise that on your website. And I said, well, that's the catch-22, right? I, that, I'm very proud of that, but that wasn't the reason I thought people should vote for me. The reason people should vote for me was because I was the best candidate. You just got the benefit that I'm also <laughs> a Chicana. And so, you know, but it, it gets tricky and everybody navigates that in a different way. Um, that's certainly been, you know, the critique of, of governor's appointments to the bench, of presidential appointments to the bench, is that you're putting identity over qualifications. And so it puts folks who come from historically marginalized communities who are seeking these positions in a really, um, it's just one more thing to navigate, right? because it will be used as a critique, it will be used as an asset, depending on who you're talking to. Um, yes. Oh, one sec, one sec. Hold on that thought. 
one of the things that we're seeing, I think the gender gap that is, is the gavel gap that's happening is there's a lag between those people going to law school and those people who are now of the generation and the experience that can be on the bench. When we were in law school, it wasn't a 50-50 female male, okay? It was probably 40-60 when Judge Goddard and Judge Cook went to law school. Judge Goddard was one of nine women in her law school class, okay? So you're talking Sandra Day O'Connor and um, you know Ruth Bader Ginsburg style time. So there's, we have to now, we're gonna see that transition and change as we instill in our youth that they can go to law school. They can go to medical school, okay? They can overcome that. They can be the first person in their family to graduate from college and go to law school. And that's kind of where, uh, taking off of what Judge Hazelrig said about saying to someone, have you thought about this? That goes to all aspects of life. Saying it to a 13-year-old, have you thought about law school, right? If you see those traits in someone, that's kind of where we're going to see that gap go. So it's not just they're not getting chosen. There may not be a qualified person at yet, right? Um, there probably is one or two, but the pool is smaller. We need to make that pool bigger um, by having those people pop through law school. Now law school 60-40, I think was one time I heard female male. Um, and, and dental school is similar as well. So it's, it starts at the very bottom and then we push forward through the top. But I am super proud to be on a court with such great representation from the top coming down. I mean, it, I think it's fabulous that we are representing the state in which we live in the way that we are. Um, because when we were practicing, being in front of Judge Cook, we, could, we weren't in front of her all the time. You know, one of four. Um, and the practice has changed so much since she was on the bench. And we are able to do things that she was not able to do. Um, with the loosening of the cannons a little bit and allowing us to come out and speak how we are and educating folks how we are, um, that those are things that they couldn't do. And so when young women see us come out, they see a difference that we didn't see. When I was growing up, it was men on the bench, right? Um, so it just starts with us being in the community too. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, we, my, uh, my daughter and mom was taking criminology down at uh, a master's in, in uh, Seattle. And uh, she was hired by the governor's office to do a study on the same thing that you're doing with the judges, only with the jury couple. Mm -hmm. You know, like the different ethnicities, mm -hmm. the different, different uh, you know, sexes and that kind of thing. And so that, that she was hired while she was going to school yeah. by the governor to, to governor's office to do that. So hopefully we see a change. Well, and there's only in the, the amount of money that they get, but. In the selection process, there's yeah. been a lot of changes in the last, gosh, when did that start? Like about six years yeah. ago, Yeah, GR 37 was changed that we are not allowed to, well, we, the lawyers are now um, not allowed to use what we call a peremptory challenge if we view that person to be of a minority or a um, marginalized class, right? So they can't try to stack that pool by removing folks that might be a juror of their peers. So that has changed in the last six or seven years since we've been on the bench. Um, and that's a huge change, probably based on studies similar to what your daughter-in-law is doing, right? Which is to try to figure out a way to remove that bias, whether it be implicit or explicit, um, and allow a more diverse panel. Yeah, because it was, it was uh, you know, race and sex and mm -hmm. all, know, all, all the identifiers. All the identifiers. Mm -hmm. And she's now going to do a the New York. Okay, we're going to have to kind of move along. It's 9 o'clock. Do we have something? I just wanted to mention the primary coming up is going to be huge, physically huge. <laughs> um, there is one Supreme Court 
position that he has contested. And it's at the very end of the ballot. So be sure to go all the way through your ballot. Um, on the back table, there are some copies of a list of um, endorsed candidates by the Skagit County Democrats. That will help a lot. And there's 28 people running for governor. I think it's 11 running for the Senate. Uh, eight for Congress. So it's going to be a huge, confusing ballot. And um, the Skagit County Democrats, they're good people. Thanks for that. Cheers away, otherwise.